My friend uh, brought me a cartoon this morning that said, we need to see him. This is a obviously wise guru sitting on a mountaintop because there's no satellite-based system to guide us on a trip down the path to enlightenment. Uh, I beg to differ with that because we have the wisdom paths and we're going to refer to them this morning. The mayor of Pittsburgh said it better and succinctly than anything that I could even possibly say about the last expression of hatred was that hatred in America has to be stopped, period. And that Alden offered some addendums to that, but that was his message. And I agree with it wholeheartedly. However, what I believe is that we are not quite sure how to do it. The wisdom practices tell us how to do it, but we're, as a group, as a people, as a church, as a sangha, we're not quite certain how to accomplish it. And the reason I say that is because after every atrocity, there's always a suggestion that we get more security, that we put people in place with guns so that this won't happen again. And again, that's not the answer. That's not the expression of a solution. And so I will read both from two wisdom past scriptures about how to do this. Now, it's not easy to do. It's not easy to accomplish. It takes a lot of guts, it takes a lot of strength, it takes a lot of will, it takes a lot of personal involvement. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Sink in. Okay. It doesn't say slay your enemy. It says pray for your enemy. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that, that despitefully use you and persecute you. Hard to do. Hard to do. Not easy to do at all. How do we accomplish the inner environment that allows us to do that, that allows us to give back in that loving way in spite of what people are saying to us or doing to us. First of all, this wisdom path, this scripture, denies the possibility that, well, maybe if we just get better security, we will deny hate. We will, we will get even with the, the hate guys. Now, in the Buddhist scripture, the suit on the simile of the soul. The Buddha says, even if bandits were to sever you savagely limb by limb with a two-handled soul, he who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. Really clear, really simple no matter what a person is doing to you, that is, in your mind, violent, hateful, no matter what cross you're being nailed up to, you must be able to reach into your heart and say, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
again, very difficult to do, but it starts with imbuing and immersing your heart in loving kindness from this moment forward. Not waiting until someone slaps you or punches you or shoots your partner in order to try to find love. It's about developing that love right now while there's no one pushing your buttons, or maybe there is someone pushing your buttons. But it's about working from this point, being deliberate, not looking for an easier way to do it. There's no easy way to love people who hate you. There's no easy way to do, to embrace people with loving kindness when they are causing pain to your body, to your heart. It's not easy to do. So it requires dedication, it requires practice, it requires commitment. Again, you don't wait until it's being done to you to try to foster it, to try to bring it up, to try to encourage it to boil over into the situation. But you do it now, before there's someone running through that door. And there's always that possibility. You know, we're here. This is not the most tolerant neighborhood to be in. I'm, I'm not talking about where the streets are. I'm talking about this whole environment in the South, in the West, in the North. You know, this doesn't go in the South. That was Pittsburgh. That was Sandy Hook. That was New York. That was California. Hate is allowed to exist because we're always looking for wiggle room. We're always looking for an easier way to love others. As long as we are willing to exercise the right to hurt another if they're trying to hurt me, that means that I have to make them lower than me in order for me to hurt them. I can't hurt people that I love as much as I love myself. So I've got to make them a lower statue. Got to give them a lower platform in order for me to give, have the permission to harm them before they harm me. So it already puts me in a no-win situation. I've got to be able to contain, develop, strengthen the love for others that equates the love that I have for myself. Otherwise, I'm always going to find a crack. I'm always going to find wiggle room in order to get them back, to get the even with them. Do them before they do me. The only way that I can deny that expression of survival is to continually fill my chambers of heartfulness with love. That's it. Every day, every morning before we go out, every evening when we come back in, when we're dealing with our family, with our partners, We, when we find it so difficult even to love our partners, to love our family members, why do we expect that we can go out and love this stranger, embrace this stranger when they're trying to do us harm? But this is the requirement. Not from any edict. Not from any social justice system but from the wisdom past. And look at the impact that this man they call Jesus had when he lovingly and voluntarily turned the other cheek and climbed up on the cross. I mean, that's, 
still being talked about, still being represented in buildings, still hanging up over our grandmother's table. It made an impression. The Prince of Peace. He was able to love even when those weren't loving him, even when those were despitefully persecuting him. This is our mandate. This is our example. Where are the evangelicals now? Evangelicals now. This is a predominantly Christian country. But we've got all of this hate. The way we take it out of the environment is to take it out of ourselves. And the way we do that is by practicing. By not hating anyone. Starting with the ones that live in the same place that we live in. Whether we talk about neighborhoods, or houses or apartments. Whether we talk about the people who come to the same places of worship that we do, or different places of worship than we do. But it starts with us. Not with the other guy, not with security, not with law enforcement. Now with more amendments to the Constitution. It starts with amending the heart. No more hate. Rise up every morning with that mantra. No more hate. Resisting the temptation to get irritated with your partner because they're stirring, making noise when they're stirring the coffee cup. When they didn't put the toilet seat down. You know, using those small things to generate that desire, to generate that habit that when something is irritating that we think about loving the person as opposed to hollering at the person, fussing at the person, slapping at the person. That's why they're there to practice on. Not to practice hatefulness with, but to practice love with. That's why they did. That's why we said we came together. To love each other. What a crock of crap. <laughs> so let's do better. Let's let it start with us. I'm letting it start with me. And I'm just as concerned about willing or manifesting the one thing that I'm saying I want to perpetuate. You know, the, the, thing, the thing that gets the gorilla in the room is to say I'm not afraid of the gorilla. Then it shows up so that you'll find out. But I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to do that. Because that's what it takes. When we plan for survival, it's because we fear death. But the folly of planning for survival is that we're all going to die. We don't know when. We hope not soon. But it's going to happen. So no matter how good our plans are, no matter how many guns and SWAT teams we surround ourselves with, we're still going to have that situation. So that doesn't work. So in my opinion, it is better to develop a strategy where we focus on life. Not death. Not preventing it. Because we can't prevent it anyway. But what we can do 
is focus on and develop the commitment to living well. And again, that starts with the people who live in our house. When we are inclined to criticize and yell at and be physical with those who live within the same premise domain that we live in, our tribe, that we treat them with such disrespect. How can we expect to love the stranger when we can't even love our brother, our family, our mother? So we have to use those that are safe to us, that we look at as teammates to practice with. We know we're getting better. We don't have to invite the gorilla in, the stranger in, the, the enemy in. We don't have to invite them in. We can just see how we're treating those who live in the same house with us. As that gets better, we know we're getting stronger. We know we're getting more committed to loving. That's how we do it. And on top of that, look how great the relationship becomes. When we're more patient, tolerant, appreciative, kind to, non-critical of, how much better the world becomes because we've decided to do something different. That's my plan. If you have a better one, I'm open for it. I'm waiting for it. I want it to hear. Because if it's better than that one, it's got to be good. It's damn good. So think about it. If you come up with it, share it with us. Because we've got to stop this foolishness. This nonsense. Hate will never overcome hate. will never allay hate in this world. It's not, this physical reality is not designed for that kind of miracle. No one's going to save us from ourselves but us. We had a savior, so they tell us. And we still got the same crap going on the day that went on then. When that Savior came and walked the earth and walked on water to inspire us, that hung on a cross to inspire us to be better people. And we're still doing the same thing. We're still building fences and bridges. We're still judging and hating people because they're different. We're not going to get another Savior unless it's you. Okay, does that sound like I'm fussing? <laughs> All right, because I love you. Whether you put the toilet seat up or not, I don't care. All right, that's what I have to say about what's happening in the world and what we can do about it. There's no point in just complaining about the world. It's about going inside and doing your research outside to see what solutions you can find to address the issue in a way that people can commit to, a, a way that people can understand, a way that makes sense. Like I said, if you've got ideas, let us have them because the world needs them. It starts with me. It starts with the community. It starts with this city. It starts with this country. Sure, we've got fingers to point at other people, at other cultures, at other religions. We sure do. We can. But why waste that energy when we can be taking this energy and putting it in our heart to make it grow? 
So if you have any suggestions, the floor is open. No ideas? I know it's a complicated situation, but we, a part of what we're practicing is reflecting on what's happening and how to improve it, how to make it gentler, kinder, more compassionate. That's what these exercises are for. It's not just sitting in and listening to things that were talked about 2,500 years ago. It's about talking about things that are happening right now, what we can do about them right now that imitates and suggests and parallels and imitates what was done 2,500 years ago. Yes, Marcia. If we are filled with love, there is no room for hate. That's true. So this is why we should practice being with the energy of love every day. And again, not waiting until the situation comes up, because then it's, it's not going to be, it's going to be difficult to find, hard to retrieve. It's about working on it on your downtime, when there's nothing bothering you, when there's no one bothering you. To begin to generate it, to fill up the reservoir so you'll have more than you need to cope with the present situation, whatever that situation might be. That's how we grow. Thank you. Yes, John. I was spent a day with uh, on a Christian retreat yesterday, and at the end of the day, the leader brought in um, disturbance. Brought in disturbance. He, he, yes, he and then he elaborated on the event that took place somewhere else. Um, and as I drove home, as a wisdom teacher, as a practitioner of love, he was as a platform of speaking. He honored, in some sense, his own disturbance when and he pr came in front of us and spoke and then each of us <clears throat> um, got to some place of understanding and meditation and as I was driving home I was about <clears throat> uh, a teaching of love and the feeling of disturbance as well as getting a sense of what the difficulty and the reaction is when you're in the field of love and the appearance of violence to that flow occurs, how do you create balance between uh, a big picture flow and then the appearance of ripples along the way. The first thing is you learn what not to do from the circumstances that you're involved in. And if you see that because a person becomes disturbed by disturbances, that doesn't help anything. That just creates more confusion. You experience that personally. So what you learned was, the one thing I can't do is allow myself to be disturbed by disturbances. I can't allow myself to hate the hater. I've got to eliminate that from my environment, from my heart, from my tendency, so that I can bring more clarity to the situation. I don't want to bring confusion to the situation. I want to bring clarity to the situation. I want to bring direction to the situation. 
And the only way that I can bring direction to the situation is have direction. I've got to be fortified so that what's happening does not cause me to have the reaction that ordinary people have. Okay? So that's how you do it. Okay. Okay, I'd like to add to this uh, situation because I was there yesterday and I'm still uh, questioning of the what is the right way. Okay, can I interrupt for a second? Which situation are you referring to? John's? Yeah, the okay, we, were, the, the, we were there together. The Christian Yeah, workshop. so this okay. person was a guest speaker. Mm -hmm. And he seems to had a you know many uh, practices, and I have a feeling that because we were in the old day there, and you know I didn't watch any of the news or something, and also the other, uh, you know, uh, the person who's leading, I'm not so sure whether he saw the news or not seeing the news, but. I have a feeling that some must have checked the, you know, the uh, internet and some didn't. So I have a feeling when you saw something disturbing outside of that, how one will um, handle this. So I was thinking about myself, let's say I was the guest speaker somewhere in the retreat. And then let's say I heard some news out there. How would I handle it myself? I was thinking unless something, that incident helped the whole people there, is it possible for me to just uh, take care of myself? Mm -hmm. Or bring it to the whole group so that everybody sort of understand the situation. So I don't know, I mean, I can sense that what I would do, but I don't know how those things has to be evaluated. Okay. Yeah. So again, you try to bring the information to the forefront without the confusion, the same thing we said to John, without confusion, without conceptualization, you know, oh, this is, this is bad, this is ugly, this is whatever. We've got we've to get back at these guys, we've got to, you know, punish these people. We've got to try to find a way to explain the situation in a balanced perspective so that we include the energy of love and compassion you know, not only for the victims, but also for the perpetrator. You know, if we didn't hear that at, mo at the moment mm -hmm. versus we heard it and we learned and we practiced together, mm -hmm. it's just very hard to see how because once that some information, news or whatever is introduced, that disturbance can be, each individual can take it very differently, even though the person who introduced guiding the right way. Mm -hmm. So that's the, my idea is, I think that sometimes when I'm having a, some, you know, information or facts or whatever, okay. like a holding it could be more beneficial. Okay, I, so yeah. I think that what we should do it's just like our parents used to make us do when we couldn't handle the moment in the house. Yeah. We had to go for a time out, mm -hmm. right? So if we are sitting there and we, we, we become alerted to a situation and we find ourselves handling it mm -hmm. badly, yeah. inappropriately from our plan, then we go take a time out so that we don't contaminate the rest of the group, mm -hmm. <coughs> right? When we are, think about it, when we reflect on it and we say, okay, okay, I know how to handle this. I know what to say. I know how to speak on this. I know how to include others on this. Then we go back with the rest of the people. Mm. Okay. That's my opinion. 
Um, it's interesting you said the thing about the time out because one of the things I tell my students is um, you can choose to be angry, but it doesn't change the situation. It changes the fact that you're angry. Don't put that on us. Mm-hmm. And you know Walker, we've talked before. But I think that in the past two years, a combination of being here and I'm going to bring in some of the things we've discussed. If you can relinquish your ego and drop and comprehend your own locus of control, there really isn't a whole hell of a lot you can do to change a situation if an angry person is going to choose to make a choice. However, if you are able to use something like that and your level of disturbance as a catalyst for your own change, Mm -hmm. then you're kind of empowering yourself to take action and you are the change that needs to be seen in the world without getting into the dynamics of or the energy that is a continuum, but using things like this as a conduit for self-reflection and what can I do for someone who I may or may not agree with, for someone who has left a spoon in the sink, for someone who's done anything, but just kind of to use that self-check and use yourself as that catalyst. You can choose to be disturbed, but the damage is done. So now what? There's not what you can do on the bigger scope, but what you can do is be that domino effect that I had brought up. And if each little link in the chain becomes part of that domino, it's not going to solve the world's crisis, but it may solve your own and maybe your neighbors and bring compassionate down the road in ways that you don't even understand. Okay. We've, we've covered some of this before. So the first thing is slowing down and asking ourselves, what is it that I can learn from the situation that I find myself in? The first thing we remember is that the object in conditioned reality does not make us angry, does not make us fearful, does not make us, you know, anything. It's just empty. But what we learn is that the trouble that I feel, the disturbance that I feel, is not from out there because that happened, because that was done, said. The disturbance, the infection, the cancer is in me. So the first thing I work with is working on the concept of non-hate, if hate is the issue non-hate, no hate, erasing the hate that I find within myself that I level on a situation, but I realize that it is my own cancer that I have to cut out. And so in working with in the right direction on the right patient, neutralizing the hate that's inside to something other than hate, I find my whole attitude and my whole perception changing toward the same situation. Then I'm able to civilly discuss it with the others involved without bringing in my own disease. But appreciating the fact that I found out that I have a disease contained within me that I have to rid myself of. And it starts with me making myself presentable and acceptable to discussion about it without ranting and raving, blaming and condemning, judging, but just simply working with the situation and how it has made me feel differently and how I'm learning how to handle it better. In other words, benefiting from my own time out. But we have to be willing to isolate ourselves, to behave ourselves. We learn how to do this. Our grandmothers taught us how to do this. But we figured that we're grown now. We don't have to go back to school. We don't have to pay attention. We don't have to listen to others. We can act any way we want to act. 
and it's okay. Well, we see that we're acting any way we want to act, but the world is not okay about that. The world is in an upheaval about that. The globe is in an upheaval about that. We do not have permission to pout. It's about us expressing all of the things, all of the merits, all of the correct way to relate to others that we learn from family and friends along the way. That we don't forget now simply because we're grown up and we don't have to listen anymore. We don't have to behave anymore because our grandmothers are dead or our grandfathers are dead. We don't have to behave. We don't have to treat others with civility anymore. I'm grown up now. I can say anything I want. I have freedom of speech. Man, don't get me started. <laughs> okay. Yes, Bob. I got a good examples of what you're talking about, I think. On, uh, well, if you get Netflix, right? Mm -hmm. Netflix, <clears throat> there, there was this uh, white nationalist video. At first I passed it by on a white nationalist. Then I thought, hey, you know, maybe there's something here. Unexpected. If anyone wants to see this, please leave the room or put your fingers in your ears and go blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I'm, I'm joking around. Uh, it turns out that um, all these people, uh, some of them were in Charlotte, Charlottesville. <clears throat> and it turns out they're really broken people. That's what they revealed. And that they um, had... <laughs> Horrible upbringings and ultimately horrible self-images, you know. Mm. And then they were, the good news is that they were um, leaving a group. This Muslim woman was interviewing them. And um, over a course of time, um, <laughs> one guy actually said, wow, it's, it's amazing. To get up in the morning and I'm not hating. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that. What, <laughs> to wake up hating, that's that's something anyway. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> they're leaving the group. They're tired of hating. Is yeah, wore them out. I guess it's heavy stuff, you know. It takes yeah, a lot it doesn't of, matter what side you're on with this hate thing. That's 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 the revelation about it all. It's not, it's not a good hate and a bad hate thing. <laughs> you suffer. This is what the wisdom paths tell us, that when you hate, you suffer. No matter whose side you might be on, no matter whose team you're playing with, you're going to suffer if you choose to hate. Yeah, poor self-images. Then I... At the other, uh, the polar, uh, I saw the polar opposite of this. <clears throat> One video. The guy was on a motorcycle, he never showed his face, never said who he was, and all he was doing was at first going around and just handing a flower to strangers. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> he was uh, going around, he would see someone in trouble, he'd pull over, Help him out. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you, this guy was never going around saying, "Hey, you know, I'm I'm a really nice guy. I help people out." And all. the people that aren't doing this are probably saying that, mm -hmm. in my experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, what was the last thing? Oh, one thing I won't forget. It's an interesting social psychology. And it happened on um, Alaska Airlines. You know, they had a problem with uh, the rear stabilizer. And one plane crashed because of it. But one plane, what happened was it suddenly went straight up. Then it went straight down. They thought it was over. And somehow or other, they were able to land the plane. And when they interviewed people coming out, they were saying that 
of course, everyone thought they were going to die, right? And they said that um, there were people turning to strangers saying, I love you. Mm. I thought that was rather interesting. Thank you, Bob. All right. I think we're finished. Let's take this next 13 minutes to imbue. That means to saturate, to die, to D-Y-E, all parts and all cells of our bodies from above our heads to below our feet. Each quadrant of our body with love and compassion. So that we can go out the door when this is over fortified for anything that might happen for any ugliness that we might be informed by, for any beauty that we might be informed by. From this moment forward, we will take the steps of armoring ourselves, not with weapons, not with attitude, but with love and with kindness and compassion. Let's prove to the world that a small group can make a big difference. And we'll begin to see that in our households. We'll begin to see that in our families. I thank you all for being strong, for being wise and intelligent people for being kind and loving people, even though you didn't know it yet. But it's ready.
I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for being who you are. Go out and gift the world with your love. Smile at a stranger. See you soon.